it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome Dr. Shane Azaya to this, uh, our latest Classical Association meeting in February. And uh, such a wonderful topic, which is new to our, our little branch uh, of Assyriology. And Shana is an Assyriologist currently at the University of Vienna, where she's a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. She's previously held postdoctoral positions uh, at Helsinki in the Centre of um, Changes in Sacred Texts and Traditions, and obtained her PhD in Assyriology from Yale University. She has numerous articles and contributions in journals such as the Journal of Near Eastern Religions, uh, the Journal of Cuneiform Studies and the Journal of Ancient Near Eastern History, uh, around a, a number of topics uh, on kings, priests, power and state-sponsored sacrilege uh, in, uh, in the Near East. Her current pro project is called The King's City, um, Comparative uh, Studies of Royal Patronage in Assur, Nineveh and Babylon in the first millennium BCE. And she's agreed very kindly and generously to talk to us this evening uh, about some of her work on Assyriology. So I'll pass over straight to you, Shana. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for including me in this wonderful series. I've been watching along and thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to live up to the standard that the previous speakers have set? Um, but I'm really thrilled to be here, especially because I've heard that Assyriology is not usually on the docket. So I congratulate those of you who are here and brave enough to listen to about 30 minutes of my world and my research. I'm really happy to share it with you. Um, let me share my slides before I get too caught up and make sure that everything works here. I hope all of you can see that. I'm, I'm seeing nods and thumbs up, great. So yes, yeah, so I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today, especially about this topic, which is something quite near and dear to my heart, which is of course, how Assyrian kings presented themselves versus the sort of gritty reality to running an empire. And um, I suspect some of you who work in the Roman empire might see some, uh, maybe some familiar things. And I'd be interested in hearing about that in the Q and A maybe a little bit. So let me just, here. Okay, so. so let's start with the empire itself. The Neo-Assyrian Empire covered quite a lot of territory at its height. That's this green area here on the map, uh, especially considering that it had expanded out from this small white triangle that I've marked there. Uh, hopefully you can all see it. That's the core Assyrian territory. This is bounded by the original capital at Ashur. This is modern Kalat Sherkat in Iraq. Uh, Nineveh, that's the largest and most famous capital. And then Arbela to the east, which is modern day Erbil, Iraq. This core was the base of operations for the Assyrian kings and the rest of the empire was organized into provinces. So the political system was an absolute monarchy. Uh, there's one king at the top of a sprawling apparatus of governors, officials, administrators, and bureaucrats. But as far as the imperial ideology was concerned, all the power and authority was concentrated in the figure of the king. He was part of a continuous royal line extending back generations and ran everything. Of course, succession wasn't always cleanly from father to son, and there were actually many different dynasties in Assyrian history. Probably the most famous one is going to be the focus of my talk today. That's the Sargonid dynasty. It's named for its founder, Sargon II, and it included his son, Sennacherib, his grandson, Esarhaddon, and his great-grandson, Ashurbanipal. Maybe you recognize some of these names already. So these kings were extremely successful, and most importantly, we know a lot about them because there are a lot of surviving textual and visual records from their reigns. So it's from these texts that we're going to get a very good idea of what exactly the ideology of kingship was and where kings claimed to derive their authority. So I will say before we begin that I will be covering a lot of texts, but I will be summarizing them for you and I put the important parts in bold. So you don't need to be frantically reading all of the texts on the slides. We can always go back in the Q&A, of course. Uh, and all of the texts that I'm discussing today have editions with translations in English available online if you're interested in reading more. Uh, 
They either come from the State Archives of Assyria Project, the SAA project, or the Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia Project that's under RIMA or RENAP. Uh, I have the links here on this slide, but I'll walk you through them. So let's start with the texts that show how the kings portrayed themselves. So luckily for us, we have really excellent textual data for this. The relevant genre is something we call royal inscriptions, which are commissioned by the kings and record their military and civic accomplishments. The longer examples usually list out annual military campaigns in chronological order. And then they typically conclude with records of building projects like extravagant renovations of palaces, temples, city walls, gates, canals, and other urban features, all usually narrated in the first person. There is also some quantity of flowery descriptions of the king, how great he is, how talented, how successful, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The royal inscriptions are written in Akkadian. This is the main language of the empire and the oldest known Semitic language. It's written in a cuneiform script, which hopefully you can see on the slide, it might be a little bit small, but it's a distinctive wedge-shaped writing made by impressing a stylus into clay. And clay was by far the most common medium for royal inscriptions. Uh, there's a lot of variety in this genre though. If you're looking at the images on the slide, you can see that the clay could be shaped as prisms or cylinders. I'll show you some tablets later. That's a very common shape as well. Uh, and royal inscriptions were also carved into larger monuments like this uh, stone stela here uh, depicting the king Adad-Nirari III. You can see the writing in the middle there. But the best thing about these texts is that not only do we have the king's own accounts, maybe a little biased, but we'll come back to that, uh, but we have hundreds of these texts and for almost every single king. So it's really possible to view them diachronically as well as synchronically. And we can reconstruct individual reigns with a lot of confidence and even get some sense of the unique personalities of these kings. What stands out right away when we look at these texts is how prevalent religion is. Royal ideology is intrinsically bound up with the state religion. Assyria, like all other Mesopotamian civilizations, had a polytheistic religious system that was embedded into all facets of society. At least that's the impression that we get. Assyria itself was called the land of Ashur, Ashur being the most supreme high god of the state. His name is also identical to the capital of Assyria, and his temple was the most important one in the empire, no matter how large it grew. He's the top of the pantheon, but there are many, many other important gods, and this will be significant for our discussion today. But it's clear from the royal inscriptions that the relationship between the king and the gods was central to the office of kingship itself. The gods selected the king, they bestowed him with the power to lead, they made him superior to all other men, they led him to victory in battle, they brought prosperity to his empire. Every success is because of the favor of the gods. So there's really a huge number of examples of these kind of statements from the royal inscriptions. So I've just given you some representative examples from the aforementioned Sarganid kings. Uh, you can see in all of these quotes how the kings claimed the gods gave them a reign without equal, a good reputation, manly strength, an exceedingly great stature, power and might to wage war, unrivaled sovereignty, and the greatest weapons. It's also really important for legitimacy purposes that the king was selected and endorsed by the gods, especially because succession wasn't always a smooth transfer of power from a father to a designated heir. In the example at the bottom here of the slide from one of Ashurbanipal's inscriptions, his claims even include the gods specifically creating him to be king and reaffirming their decision well before his birth. This next example from Esarhaddon shows how the gods provided the various trappings of kingship. One god enables his accession, another gives him the crown, another the throne, another his weapon, and the last a divine radiance that overwhelms his opponents. That the gods are responsible for coronation is found in iconography as well, as you can see here in this coronation scene that was originally on a helmet. Uh, 
It shows an Assyrian king being crowned by presumably the goddess Ishtar or Mulisu. Uh, both were high status goddesses at the time. And he's receiving the emblems of kingship from Asher himself. But returning to the text examples I've provided here on the slide, you can already start to see a quid pro quo involved in this divine endorsement. So Esther Haddon writes that he had good omens for refurbishing some damaged cult statues. Uh, these are anthropomorphic images of the gods and rebuilding temples. While the passage here from Ashurbanipal pairs the gods command to exercise kingship and their willingness to destroy his opponents with them entrusting him to provide for their sanctuaries. And it is indeed the case that in return for their considerable support that the gods provided, the king had a number of important responsibilities in the religious sphere. You can see a nice example here of Ashurbanipal after one of his famous lion hunts as portrayed in his palace reliefs. So in this section of the reliefs, he's actually pouring out a libation over the defeated lions as an offering to the gods, who he credits with making him powerful enough to fight lions in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is shown in other parts of the relief. So what religious responsibilities did the king actually have? Well, one thing that's special about the Assyrian kings is that they were the highest priest of the god Ashur. So their role as a religious leader was combined with their political office. Uh, that meant that the king's authority included a lot of responsibilities in the religious domain. And one of the most important was his patronage of temples. It was the king's duty to ensure that temples were well-maintained, fully outfitted, and functioned smoothly. The empire's wealth from conquests and taxes meant where they, that was meant to go to support the temples. So this meant undertaking expensive construction and renovation projects, giving donations, repairing the cult statues and their jewelry and their clothing, ensuring the daily offerings and paying the staff, of course. Kings also had direct oversight over the inner workings of the temple. For example, it was their prerogative to appoint and confirm priests and other cultic personnel to control the treasuries and to grant exemptions from taxes or conscripted labor. Now, this might seem like a lot to juggle, but if you ask the kings, they fulfilled these duties masterfully. I've put an example here of a stela from Babylon. It shows Ashurbanipal carrying a work basket on his head to begin the restoration of Marduk's temple, the most important temple in Babylonia. It was in the capital at Babylon. Babylonia was technically a separate polity uh, to the south of Assyria, but it was largely under Assyrian control at the time, so uh, they counted it as part of their holdings. But this basket-bearing act was a symbolic and ritual gesture, a little bit like inviting a celebrity or a politician to break ground on an important building project by taking the first shovel into the dirt. So this was meant to show just how dedicated the king was to the work of venerating the gods and personally maintaining their temples. But if you look at the royal inscriptions, you also get the impression that the kings were completely devoted to the temples. And I mean all of the temples, keep that in mind. You can see in these examples that the king emphasized the correct worship of the deities, but especially taking care of renovating and outfitting their temples, as here completing the sanctuaries from their foundations to their crenellations and establishing appropriate procedures. These projects were often both extensive and expensive. They relied on import goods such as cedar trees from Lebanon and gold, possibly from Turkey or Egypt. State taxes of silver, livestock, wine, and dates were also directed into the temples. Silver used both for decorative purposes and money, while the foodstuffs were used for offerings. Ashurbanipal does an especially nice job of laying out many of the priestly services expected of the king. Food offerings, renovating the temples, adding decorations like gold and silver to make them, quote, shine like the stars making the cultic accessories so the rituals can take place, ensuring bountiful regular offerings and donations, and overall being, quote, assiduous towards the sanctuaries of the gods and constantly following their ways. So this passage is a really good snapshot of this part of royal ideology. So far, so good, right? Well, remember that Assyrian religion was polytheistic. And remember that I said kings were responsible 
for all of their temples. And remember just how large the Assyrian Empire's territory was. Now imagine, every single city had at least one local temple, and that temple could have multiple different shrines within them. Some gods even had temples in multiple cities. So how were kings supposed to be patrons to all these temples equally? Well, the short answer is they weren't. Resources were finite. Even with the wealth from the taxation system and trade and supplementing that with spoils from conquest, it's not a bottomless fund. Labor was finite too. Hiring workers is expensive and conscripted workers had to be spread between the annual campaigns and other building projects like palaces, city walls, canals, roads, and so forth. So what we can see, especially in the building reports in the royal inscriptions, is that the kings prioritized temples that were politically or ideologically important to them. Makes sense. Basically, Asher's temple was the most important and received the most support, but also temples in the political capital of, of the time, which was Nineveh for the later Sargonid kings. Sometimes other temples were particularly important to individual kings, like when Ishtar of Arbela became one of Ashurbanipal's main patron deities and so became more important in his reign. But this left a large number of temples much lower on the imperial to-do list. I've called these minor or peripheral, but it's a bit of an eclectic category that includes not just temples for gods that were maybe not considered the major gods in state religion, but also temples that were geographically on the periphery or part of a conquered territory and just smaller temples generally, even those in the same city as a larger temple. So for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on the realities of the imperial program of temple patronage from the perspective of priests working in these smaller institutions. We don't know as much about this class of individuals as we do about the kings and their viewpoints, but we do have a really important and useful source of information, letters. The letters are pretty small texts, as you can see here. Uh, they were small so they could be transported easily, but they actually contain a lot of information about individuals and their day-to-day -day concerns. We have hundreds of letters, many of them from temple staff to the king, some between priests, and some from priests to other officials. Now, a few caveats to, about this corpus. People usually wrote letters when there was a problem or a reason to complain. So the letters can sometimes give a maybe over-exaggerated impression of nothing works properly in this empire. So the polar opposite view of the royal inscriptions. And we wouldn't expect, for instance, that small temples that were managing just fine on their own to write to the king saying so, which means they're not really visible in this corpus. Also, we often only have one side of this conversation. The king's responses are often missing since they would have been kept where they were received and not in the palace archives where many of the letters were found because they were sent to the king. Nonetheless, the letters are where we can start to peel away this veneer of perfection from the royal inscriptions and observe that a local priest could be facing a number of problems without state support. They may not have enough money to pay staff salaries or other costs. Their temple and ritual equipment might not receive regular maintenance, or they might need to replace some of their equipment. They might be short staffed if the king hasn't appointed priests in a while. Offerings for both the daily rituals as well as festivals might become harder to provide without funding, donations, or taxes being sent to them. And of course, if they weren't themselves tax and labor exempt, like the major temples were, then the king could further funnel resources and labor from the temple to whatever state project they were needed for. So let's take a look at what the letters have to say about three of these concerns, resources for rituals, staff issues, and temple renovation, to see what our demographic of local priests were struggling with and some of the solutions they came up with when the king's help wasn't forthcoming. So we'll start with the rituals. The most important job of the temple was keeping the daily cult as uninterrupted as possible. 
Daily rituals tended to include clothing and adorning the deities with jewelry. Again, these are anthropomorphic statues, uh, providing them with the food and drink offerings. And these could include livestock, beer, bread, sesame oil, honey, wine, and other foodstuffs or incense. And overall, not being able to carry out this daily feeding ritual could put the entire cult into jeopardy. So livestock was a particular problem being a rather expensive commodity that was needed every day with additional needs on festival days. So here we can see a letter from a priest complaining that the temple's shepherd hasn't been providing sheep. So for the entire month, the priest has been obliged to go buy sheep at the market and fatten them up for slaughter himself. Now this is the Asher temple, the most important temple in the empire. So it not only had regular sheep deliveries through taxes, but also had enough financial resources to purchase its own sheep when this kind of bottleneck occurred. Smaller temples may not have had this luxury, not necessarily receiving livestock through taxes and not having the pasture land needed to keep livestock nor the cash to buy them. We can certainly see this in letters from temples in the slightly later Neo-Babylonian period, where a smaller temple has to write and beg a larger temple in a nearby city for just some oxen because they have none for their sacrifices. So interdependence between temples is one way to solve the problem if you can't turn to the king. Textiles are also important, both as clothing for the images of the gods, as well as for the priests themselves. Making textiles, especially dyed textiles, was a specialized craft, and not every temple had the necessary skilled weavers. So like with the oxen example I just showed, here we again see cooperation between temples as a possible solution. These letters show priests in a relatively minor temple in Kerbail having issues because they haven't gotten the textiles they need. They historically relied on weavers from the temple of Ishtar in Arbela, instead of getting finished products issued from the palace or even making their own, but now they have a shortage. The text is unfortunately broken, but the implication is that they have a new supplier that has not come through. With some negotiations back and forth, they do resolve the matter. The palace will send red wool and the weavers from the temple in Arbela will come and turn the wool into clothing for the gods. So Kerbail's location isn't confirmed, we're not sure, but you can see on the map one hypothesized location and its relation to Arbela. So it was a bit of a trip for these weavers. So you, you gotta hope that the Arbela temple didn't end up having textile issues of their own in the meantime, because they had sent their weavers away to help a different temple. But let's talk about problems with staff. First, I should qualify. The term priest is rather flexible. So alongside ritual practitioners, it included people who provided for the rituals, so bakers and brewers and such. Uh, and as I mentioned, kings were supposed to appoint people into these offices. We can see in this first example that this was indeed the case. The chief baker had been appointed by King Sennacherib, and he was consecrated as a priest, which involved being shaved completely from head to toe and receiving his special priestly hat. Priesthoods were often passed down from father to son. And here we have a situation where the chief baker has died and his son has been waiting for royal confirmation so that they can consecrate him into this position. And he's been waiting quite a long time, eight years already. Presumably he's been doing this job in the meantime anyway, otherwise the temple has had to make do with no chief baker for almost a decade. This isn't a unique situation in the letters, and it was probably the case in many smaller temples that the king's approval of a new staff member was a formality that came later or never. The king himself could actively cause staff shortages as well, as we can see in this letter from a temple official in Babylon, who writes that the king has summoned two of his priests away. Another letter reveals that they're carpenters. It's never specified what the king needs them for, but the tone is that they've been away for a while. This priest gently points out to the king that he needs these men to return and help with the clothing ceremonies. He complains that he's completely alone and no one else can help him with this ritual. 
maybe fearing that his complaint is a little too accusatory to the king, he ends with, well, the king should do as he deems best. But it's clear that he's inconvenienced by the situation. One solution for temples was to simply acquire more staff in these cases, either filling those empty positions themselves, like with the chief baker's son, or purchasing temple dependents. We have, for example, legal texts like this one, where the head priest of the Ninorta temple in the city Kala paid for a specialized weaver of multicolored cloth trim from the queen's household in Nineveh, adding that weaver to the staff of his temple instead. Another letter suggests that the members of the local community would step in, even if they weren't really qualified. This letter writer complains that the men carrying the cult image of Ishtar during some sort of ritual or festival procession were not from the elite established families that usually populated the priesthoods. In fact, he calls them simpletons or commoners, but notes that the priests who had been serving in the temple under the king's father had already moved to a different city, leaving the remaining locals to carry on the cult, regardless of their social status or, unsuit or suitability. It was still preferable that somebody continues the ritual processions rather than discontinuing it. One other alternative was having existing staff in a temple take on the responsibilities of vacant offices. This happened in a Nabu temple where one relatively low-level priest named Pulu, a lamentation singer, ended up taking on almost all of the important roles in his temple in a bid to keep it functional with minimal staff and resources. A letter of complaint was sent to the king about Pulu's actions and reports that he was running the temple's administration, renovation projects, hiring, food and drink offerings, treasury and cultic jewelry control, and even conducted rituals that other cultic personnel were usually responsible for. The letter sums up, quote, now Pulu, the lamentation priest, has been acting in accordance with only himself in the temple of Nabu without the permission of the king. No one has authority and no one says anything to him. We only have this information because the letter writer, as it turns out, has a personal grudge against Pulu and actually wants him to get in trouble. So we might imagine that staff in other small temples could have been using similar tactics, but they're invisible in our text record because no one's written about it. So let's turn now to temple maintenance and restoration. This was something that the kings loved to brag about in their royal inscriptions because it was a really visible performance of both their piety and their success as king, since they could afford to lavishly spoil their gods with extravagant renovations and luxury goods. But again, the impression that we get from letters is far less majestic. So temples were made from mud brick baked in the sun. So while they were pretty sturdy, they needed regular upkeep, especially if there was any flooding or other damage. But many of the temples were poorly equipped to handle these renovations themselves, whether it was because of funds, materials, or logistics. For example, we have in this first letter, a stressed out governor whose city has several temples that need renovations. He's clearly not confident that enough material is available locally. To help ease some of that burden, he asks the king to force a neighboring governor to send them the straw, which they need to mix with the soil and water in order to make the mud bricks. Without state oversight, there was also the risk of incompetence or disorganization such as at one temple in Dare that was being completely renovated from top to bottom. But once the foundations were finished, everyone in charge tried to avoid responsibility and procrastinate on the work, so there was no progress at all. The letter writer is especially concerned about this because the Prince of Elam, a kingdom to the east in what's now Iran, has decided to generously send some mud brick masons to help them. So since Dare was a border town between Elam and Mesopotamia, the letter writer fears that this is a strategic ploy by the Elamites to start expanding their territory into Mesopotamia. In the rest of the letter, he urges the king to send builders and a bodyguard to take control of this project. We also have occasional reports about 
structural collapse, like this letter complaining that the entire wall behind the cult image of Ishtar in Arbela fell down and needed to be rebuilt completely. In worse cases, the entire temple collapsed, like the unfortunate temple of Amuru. It's not clear what caused this catastrophic failure, but the god and his retinue were moved into the nearby Anu temple while the Amuru temple was rebuilt. These projects would have presumably needed state support as they would have been very costly undertakings. In the worst case scenario, a temple would not only become dilapidated, but abandoned to complete decay, like in this royal inscription where a middle Assyrian king claims that a temple to Shamash, formerly a prominent institution, had become like ruins that squatters had moved into. We don't know the circumstances of this particular abandonment, but presumably temples that were falling apart and weren't able to secure fundings to renovate were more likely to end up abandoned in the end. Sometimes the local priests and officials were apparently wealthy enough to make necessary repairs themselves. One case of this is preserved in a rare brick inscription that imitates those of the kings, but was commissioned by a priest of Ashur. This priest was apparently well off enough that he could renovate the Nergal temple in the city Kutha all on his own. Unfortunately, a photo of that brick inscription is not available, but I've provided an example from King Ashurbanipal so you can see what they looked like, a brick with an inscription stamped into it. And although he wasn't a priest, I'll briefly mention here Belharan Beli Utsur. He is an official who founded a whole city and built a temple in it that he promised to support financially and with food and incense offerings forever. This is pretty remarkable, especially since he left this inscription on a stela that very much imitates the royal style in both text and iconography, as you can see here on the slide. A really telling example of the disorganization of the empire is this report about a number of gods that were left essentially in another temple's storage. These gods had been removed from Babylonia along with Marduk, the patron god of the capital, uh, the patron god of the capital at Babylon. He's called Baal in this inscription here. Uh, Marduk and the gods from other Babylonian cities were taken away by King Sennacherib as part of a war with Babylonia. Sennacherib's son, Esarhaddon, wanting to patch up relations with Babylonia, tried to return the gods during his reign. While Marduk ended up making it back safely to Babylon eventually, these six less important cult images from other cities weren't so lucky. In fact, they were left in this random temple far from home and stayed there until, until King Ashurbanipal, Esarhaddon's son, sent an official to this region on some state business. And it's only by chance that the official discovered these forgotten gods in this temple. While the gods would have been treated well as guests and given daily cult offerings in their host temple for the duration of their stay, their absence from their home temples would have caused severe problems and complications for their local communities who would have had to use substitute cult symbols or simply hope their gods would be returned eventually. Unfortunately, while returning Marduk to Babylon was ideologically strategic for trying to win over Babylonia, these gods and their temples were simply too unimportant to attract the king's attentions. So let's recap. Royal inscriptions promote an ideal symbiotic relationship between the king and the gods. The gods give the king his royal authority and legitimacy and success. And in return, the king is a constant patron to all of the gods, their cults and their sanctuaries across the empire. At least, at least that's how it should work in theory. In practice, we have an unequal patronage of temples stemming from a finite amount of material and labor resources, with the most important temples in the religious and political capitals being prioritized above others. This meant that minor and more peripheral temples were much more vulnerable to logistical issues and a lack of resources, facing challenges ranging from interruptions in the daily cult to catastrophic events like structural collapse. Nonetheless, the letter corpus gives us a unique insight into daily life, showing us how the smaller temples managed to cope with state absence in a few different ways, independently, 
adapting to their situations, cooperating with their neighbors, especially other temples, and relying on their local communities. Thank you.